Well, good morning to you. It's the Nikki Maduro Show. Welcome to it on this Thursday. Nikki is not here today, but that doesn't mean we don't have a show. We're going to forge on through. Her daughter has a procedure that they have to uh, handle today. And so we've got this, right? We got the uh, the show covered for her. Um, I was sending, uh, my apologies for the delay, I was sending a last minute email to Loretta Lynch, former president of the California Public Utilities Commission, who I was hoping would come on the show today. So hopefully she gets my email. We'll see. She may come, she may not come. Um, I hadn't heard from her, so I wanted to send her one last message. But, um, oh, and I, you know what else I wanted to thank Lori for the emails. I got your message about the cough going around the Bay Area. I haven't been able to read the story yet. I will. But I'm telling you, just from the headline, it seems like I'm a victim. Man, this cough is like one of those things that just lingers. So <sighs> I'm waiting for it to go away. I saw this story of um, what happened in the primaries. And I hadn't, you know, it doesn't seem like a big deal until maybe it could become something. At this point, I'm grasping for anything that shows me or indicates to me that we're not going to have another Trump presidency, right? And so, in the latest primaries, two out of 10 Republicans are voting against Trump. 20%? I'll take 20%. The question is, what's going to happen to the 20%? Because when they voted against Trump, they voted for other Republicans, like Nikki Haley, or Ron DeSantis, or whoever else. But now that those options aren't available, do they go back to Trump or do they gravitate over toward President Biden or some other independent third party candidate? I don't know. But what this article does say is that a 20 percent voting block of Republicans that didn't vote for Trump could spell trouble for him. Um, Ohio which took uh, carried Trump easily in both 2016 and 2020. Trump won 79% of the vote in Tuesday's primary. Uh, Nikki Haley was at 14%. Kansas, uh, Trump only got 76% of the vote there. Florida, where Trump barely won in 2016 and only won by three points in 2020, he receives 81% to Haley's 14%. And the the political analyst, like David Axelrod, who's a Democratic consultant, admittedly, says it's a problem for him, that there's no conceivable reason for him to be leaking 20% at this point other than a protest vote. And so what happens to the people that are protesting? Where do they go? I mean, I'm not going to say 80% isn't strong. It is. But... Where do those other 20% go? Do they go over to President Biden? I like it. A member of the RNC says many of the folks that haven't voted for him in the Republican Party may be anti-Trump people that are hardcore about it who won't vote for him in November, right? They could be never Trumpers. One can hope. One can only hope that we have that much faith in people. Um. One RNC member warned for months that nominating Trump uh, would be a way to um, lose the election, that it wasn't a smart strategy. So I don't know. Um, maybe it was a protest vote and those people will swing back around and vote in a Republican fashion. Don't know. Um, an exit poll of Republican voters in Ohio found 16% of Republicans said they were unlikely to vote for Trump in the general election. Of that group, 9% said they'd likely vote for President Biden instead. Scoop away all that vote. That's great. Do it. In Virginia, 27% um, of Republican voters said they would not support Trump in November. In North Carolina, 14% said no. No, never Trump. Arizona, Georgia, Wisconsin, three states that went Trump in 2016, but Biden won by very thin margins in 2020, but still won. Um, Republican voters played a big role in that. So that may be the outcome again. And that may be the 
the silver lining, the glimmer of hope, whatever it is that I'm looking for. Uh, something funny. Well, I don't know if it's funny. Maybe a parenting fail happened to me yesterday. My son was talking to me about this girl in his class who is kind of saying some nasty things, not just to him, but to other people. She's, I don't want to call her a bully, but he says, he's, he calls her that. And so I said, why don't you tell her, if ask her if she's ever heard of the phrase, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. And he looks at me and he says, mom, that's not how it goes. I said, what do you mean that's not how it goes? He goes, you have a sign in your office that says, if you can't say something nice, say something funny. <laughs> I do have that sign right here in my office. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. I mean, that's what he, because he, I have the sign in here, that's what he thought the saying or the cliche was, but no. Parenting fail on my part. Um, Les Parnow, or Parnas, Lev, Lev Parnas. He is a former Trump ally. When I say former, I mean former in a big way. Also an associate of Rudy Giuliani. And he is now singing like a canary to whomever will listen. This guy, I mean, great. Tell the truth. Finally, I hope it soothes your soul. Fantastic. He not only um, gave an earful to the House Oversight Com Impeachment uh, Inquiry yesterday, he also went on to Fox News and gave them an earful as well. And I don't know if they played the whole thing, but he named names. He said, um, and he, Parnas admittedly helped Trump um, by trying to pressure Ukraine into investigating Joe Biden. He tells the committee, the um, impeachment inquiry committee, that various Republican politicians and members of the conservative media purposely spread disinformation about the current president. What? We've known this the whole time. Finally, someone's actually saying it, right? He named names, including Fox News host Sean Hannity and Congressman Pete Sessions. He pointed them both out, uh, well, he pointed Pete Sessions out as a member of the Oversight Committee as well. Someone who, he says, has been spreading misinformation on purpose that he knew was a misinformation right? They know it's a lie, and they're still doing doing it for political reasons. This started when Congressman Raskin asked Parnas about when the campaign to dig up dirt on Biden became a campaign to spread lies and disinformation about President Biden. He said, after the investigation turned up nothing at all, that is when this kind of happened, that Giuliani and a journalist journalist named John Solomon, who was responsible for pushing many Ukraine conspiracy theories, tr started trying to push narratives that they had not never been validated, that they knew were not true. So they started lying, basically, is what they started doing. He said, basically, a letter would come over from somebody in Ukraine I'd hand it over to John Solomon. Next thing you knew, he was on Fox TV two hours later with Sean Hannity. He said Giuliani then started working with Russian agents and Russian assets to spread anti-Biden propaganda and disinformation around May or June of 2019. And he said that Giuliani was absolutely aware that the Russian assets and sources were working on behalf of Russian President Vladimir Putin. He said Giuliani had no problem spreading lies as long as it fit the narrative. This is what he's telling. He's telling congressional investigators. He's telling Fox News. He's, have you heard? I mean, is it front and center to you? As, as, have we heard the information enough? I don't think so. He said the main group it was being pushed through was Fox, mainly Sean Hannity and some other media personalities over there. He said there were other people doing bidding for the Russians, people in Congress, and he named Senator Ron Johnson, Congressman Pete, Se Pete Sessions, um, 
who happened to be sitting there right now. He said, it was with me from the very beginning of this journey, finding and digging up dirt on Joe Biden. Wow. I mean, it's not like we didn't know they were trying to make up lies. You know, it's not like we didn't know that everything was false and that nothing could be proven. But to hear him say it, it's so cold and calculated and devious and dirty, low down dirty. Yeah. I, it's, I mean, wow. They're doing the bidding of the Russian government. And that doesn't concern anyone. I'm sorry, but if that's who you're backing and that's who you're voting for, that's not patriotism. Unless you're Russian, (laughs) then okay. Scary. That whole thing is scary to me. Um, and I don't, I don't think that you're going to see that on Fox News. They're not going to tell you that on Fox News. That doesn't fit their story. It doesn't fit the story they want to tell. How about just tell the truth? What's wrong with that? Uh, Lev Parnas telling truths and naming names. This is a BFD, right? Trump's co-conspirators in Congress media have gotten away with hiding in the darkness. And they're on the committee to investigate the president. I'm telling you, someone's going to make a movie and we're not going to, we're going to look at it and go years from now. Did that really happen? Yes. Yes. It all happened. And half of the country was like, whatever, not a big deal. Okay. Wild and crazy. I can't believe it. Well, let's say hello to everybody in the chat and good morning to you. Oh, talking about your coffee and your tea. You guys are talking about coffee and tea and I am, I'm over here digging into politics. Eric's on a second cup of coffee. Spencer's a tea guy. All right. <laughs> Judy alternates between the two. Mm-hmm. Got some coffee in one hand and tea in the other. I have my uh, hibiscus tea from Coachella Valley Coffee this morning. Sponsor of the Mark Thompson Show. Not the Nikki Medora Show, but we love them just the same. Um, let's see. Oh, Spencer. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the $5. At least my sister isn't an anti-vaxxer with her son. That's good. I mean, uh, yeah, hey, you got to grab all the positive news where we can get it. So I'm glad that her son is safe and that everybody's vaccinated over there. That's good stuff. Uh, a lot of people talking about the Oprah documentary. I haven't watched it, um, but I have heard about it from friends who wa- did watch it. It's the one where she's talking about Ozempic, right? And that she's um, been on a weight loss drugs. I haven't seen it. Lori says it's pretty good. Uh, I did not have uh, internet issues, but I was trying to send out that last ditch email to see if Loretta Lynch could come on the show. Yeah. Thank you for uh, for your patience. Donald says, my wife caught something last week. She's over it, except for that cough. I'm telling you, the cough lingers. Uh, Pardon me. Gross. Um, The cough lingers and just won't go away. And it it gets worse when you lay down, right? Then you feel like you're keeping everyone awake, except for everyone here has the cough. So Uh, Sandy got a shingles vaccine yesterday. Oh, sorry about the sore arm. But I'm glad you still feel good. That's great. Really important, right? God, the last thing I want is the shingles. So I'm glad you got the vaccine. Eric says, remember, Democrats fall in love. Republicans fall in line. A lot of, uh, a lot will vote Trump anyway, rather than vote for any Democrat. I hope they're never Trumpers, Eric. Don't pop my balloon and rain on my parade and whatever other cliche I can come up with. <laughs> Maybe you're right. But I'm. Uh, it makes me a little hopeful. I don't know. Uh, oh, Sandy, yeah, I got to go back in for the second shot. Yeah, that's okay. Good, you're getting it done. You should feel good about that. Uh, Judy says, oh, talking about that vaccine. Yeah, yikes. 
Blue Spark writes, what I wish my dad would have done, he voted GOP always, but he would have been thoroughly disgusted by any number of things uh, Trump de dumpty said or did. Maybe just not vote. How sad is that? I, mean, I think if you know they're lying and being deceitful, that you should be able to see through it. And even if you don't like the policies of the other party, vote vote for that party on principle. But maybe you're right. Maybe the better thing is just to not vote because I couldn't vote. If I was a Republican, I couldn't vote for him. Maybe if I was a Republican, I'd be a completely different person. So I guess I can't say that. John says when Clinton was in office, they had the Arkansas Project funded by Richard Mellon Scaffey. It was a project to dig up dirt on the Clintons. When they found little, they started making stuff up. Yeah. I mean, that's the way of politics, right? There's always that opposition research or... I don't know, making things up, but this takes it to an extreme and working with a foreign government. Come on now. I don't know. Um, is that Daniel, maybe Ron Johnson could share his collaboration with Russia's, uh, with Russia sin with honesty, his honesty app with his son. Right. Uh, since he seems to be using that in good practice, really Christianity. Come on. Right. The people that pardon me, I have to cough. The people that are supposed to not lie, the people that are the most religious, um, the most devout, you know, that are carrying the Bible around in their briefcase, are the ones that are like, lie, lie, lie to get whatever we want. Come on now. It's crazy. Calvin writes, Saudi Arabia getting pro-golf, paying off Jared and Mnuchin billions, getting away with cutting up the uh, the reporter, and finally, 9-11, no consequences for their participation. It's terrible. Terrible. Mm. Well, thank you very much for all the good comments. Um, one more here. Uh, David Brock was one of the dirt diggers on the Clintons. He turned into a liberal and spilled the beans. That woman, or Juanita Broderick, said uh, Clinton attacking her was just part of the project. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, that, that's the thing is once those allegations are out there, who, you they're out there in the world and there's always going to be people that believe it. So crazy. Brian, with a good point, the most important issue is not to let Trump win and corrupt uh, and poison our country even more. Well, from your lips to God's ears, right? I don't know. And a lot of people are not happy with the Supreme Court. I'll tell you a little more about that in just a moment. But first, uh, Supreme Court Justice Sotomayor is not happy at all with her colleagues on the court for lifting that hold on the Texas migrant law. And it went back into place, but, you know, it went back and forth, back and forth for a hot second. She got pretty upset about what they did. She wrote the dissent uh, and she said, further chaos and crisis in immigration enforcement will happen by allowing the Texas law to go into effect without first giving careful reasoned consideration to its constitutionality. Since the issues underlying arguments over the law are serious and unprecedented. She's, uh, this uh, law that Texas passed regulates the entry and removal of non-citizens. It explicitly instructs state courts to disregard any ongoing federal immigration proceedings. And Sotomayor said that law upends the federal state balance of power that has existed for more than a century, in which the national government has exclusive authority over entry and removal of non-citizens. And she's hot about it. She is not happy with what her colleagues have done here saying that the law can go into effect. A different court said it can't for a whole set of different reasons, which now has to go through the appeals process as well. But yeah, she's a, you know, I, I love that she came out so strongly on that. I do. But And, and here, this brings me to my point. A study, and we've seen other studies like this, but here, here again, we have more. This study finds that Americans' trust in the Supreme Court has tanked post-Dobbs. 
who among us has faith that the Supreme Court isn't bought and paid for, isn't strictly political? Because it used to be, no matter, you know, maybe it had a conservative leaning, maybe it had a liberal leaning, but there's always a chance that these people who are elevated to the Supreme Court are able to be fair and partial judges, are able to really look at the Constitution, to look at the issues and not bring their politics into the game, into the cases. But it has become more of a game. Americans who believe the U.S. Supreme Court held itself above the political fray are now becoming more and more disillusioned in the wake of the decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. There was a study published this month in the journal Science Advances, noting that for decades, people on both sides of the political aisle tended to put the Supreme Court kind of up on this pedestal, that we trusted it to make decisions fairly on the basis of law, on the basis of precedent, even if we didn't trust Congress, you know, even if we maybe were iffy on the executive branch, we still trusted the Supreme Court, but no more. We're done. Apparently, all it took was Clarence Thomas for us to really tell us the true story. Since 2020, the court's special status has evaporated with the trust in it by the public falling by 20 percentage points. 2022 marked the lowest levels of trust recorded in half a century. Last year, roughly the same as that. Um, and they say it specifically starts when the Supreme Court rules 6-3 to three in Dobbs v. Jackson, the Women's Health Organization, returning the question of abortion access to each individual state. Um, I, I, you know... I don't know if we were so foolish over all that time. Pardon me. I don't know if we were so foolish to say, oh, this institution is above everything, right? This is, um, these are the people that uh, we can all trust as a nation. Or have it, has it been this way the whole time? And we were just like, oh, Supreme Court, we love you. No. The findings of this latest survey of the public suggest at least part of the public increasingly sees the court as politicians in robes with troubling inf implications for its role in our democracy. That's what the research shows. And I'm right along with them, very disillusioned. And I know that most of you are too. We've talked about it before. And here we go again. You know? Yeah. Donna talking about Kavanaugh, Alito, Gorsuch, Thomas, corrupt or got corrupt. Um, I guess maybe if you know you're in there and you're thinking, I'm not making that much money, but I have the power and influence that I can peddle that will allow me to make more money. And you come from common stock. Well, hey, right? Eric talks about Barrett, who's always been a right wing loon. Donald doesn't think she's corrupt, just religious. I don't know. When you get in there and you see the money other people are collecting hand over fist, I don't trust any of them now. I would say if Ruth Bader Ginsburg was were still on the court, I'd trust her. But I don't now I don't know. I think the whole scenario is called into question for me. Lady Beatrice got disappointed with our Supreme Court after RBG died, yeah. Barrett, she calls a joke. How sad is that? I mean, and look how quickly that tide turned. You know, at one point we all believed in them and then we we looked at it and they took away our reproductive rights, our autonomy over our own bodies, for women at least, and we thought, oh, that's all political, must all be political. And even if that wasn't the tide that turned you, then there's Thomas, Thomas, right? And the supposed um, nonprofits that they formed or whatever type of groups that they formed specifically to collect cash and the house bust from hell. Yeah. 
Calvin says, it's understandable that everyone leans liberal or conservative. When you allow a personal agenda to dictate your actions actions as a judge, you have no business on any court. And couldn't agree more with Eric, who says, and I just lost it. Um, there it is. Religion, he said, shouldn't have a place in our government or our laws. But it does. It does. It does. It does. And it sucks. <laughs> and I agree with you, Eric. Separation of church and state, right? That's not the way it's going in some of these crazy states. As a matter of fact, in Alabama, if I don't know if you read the the uh, anti-IVF ruling that came from the Supreme Co- Court for the state of Alabama, and they invoke all kinds of religion, and they have religion up the wazoo in their co- state constitution. I thought that was not what we were about as Americans. Mm. Okay. John says because many of them sat there during confirmation hearings and swore they'd never change past decisions. Yeah. Right. They'd follow the law, right? Um, Deidre writes, I blame McConnell for the situation we're in. Denied Garland, but allowed Barrett. Didn't vote to impeach Trump, which would have prohibited him from running again. Yeah. I mean, yes to all of that. But on one hand, when I think of all the things that could have gone wrong on January 6th and the people that stood up for democracy on that day, and then, you know, you you look at the people that had the chance to do other things to protect the country, as you mentioned, Deidre. I mean, it's a disappointment. Heather writes, even on our money, in God we trust nonsense. How is that separation of church and state? Oh, but Heather, it's tradition, right? We're a Christian country. No. All right, we'll move on here. Um, let's go back to the Biden testimony or the Biden, uh, the impeachment inquiry, I should say. And apparently, this, from what I understand, they're going to ask. I didn't hear the word subpoena. They're going to ask President Biden if he will come testify in the impeachment inquiry. Now, do you think you should do it? Because I don't think you should do it. I mean, are you cheaping yourself to get involved in that, you know, clown car of of an impeachment inquiry? I wouldn't do it. But maybe there's a case to be made if he goes and talks to them, you know, It'll show the American people he's not afraid of anything. He'll get right in there and get it done. Uh, no, I don't think so. I think I hope he stays very far away from that. But of course, if he doesn't and he ignores the request to come speak, come testify, then they'll make something out of that. He didn't come because he was afraid. Hmm. No. Mm Mm-mm. Uh, I don't think you should do it. I don't. I really don't. I think it's a joke. And I think it demeans him by getting involved in in testifying in that. And I hope he doesn't. I really do. Florida has this new law. And some might think, oh, this is a good thing. This might really work here in California. Governor Ron DeSantis is signing this bill banning homeless encampments and public sleeping in Florida. He he kind of compared spring breakers and their lawlessness. I don't know if you've seen the videos of young spring break partiers fighting in the streets and they're drunk and hopped up on whatever drugs and being taken to the local jail. He's comparing spring break crowds to the homeless. And he says this new law is to protect law-abiding citizens. So yesterday, DeSantis, governor of Florida, signs this bill that bans homeless people from setting up tents or sleeping in public spaces. He said, ultimately, the issue with spring break plays into the issue of homeless encampments. The law takes effect October 1st. He said, we have to govern this state and our communities with an eye toward what's in the best interest of the law-abiding citizen. Too often, people in other states, in other cities, 
they're not doing it well. It's like they let the inmates run the asylum, he says. I don't completely disagree with that. However, he's awfully callous about this whole thing. This new bill that he signed into law yesterday uh, defines public camping as residing overnight in a temporary outdoor habitation used as a dwelling or living space evidenced by the erection of a tent or other temporary shelter, presence of bedding or pillows, or the storage of personal belongings. So if you're homeless and you want to sleep on the street in Florida, you can't have a tent, a blanket, or a pillow, or your stuff in a cart park nearby, but apparently maybe you could just lay on the sidewalk and sleep if there's nothing else. I don't think that either. They do have to provide um, cities and counties only able to move people sleeping on city streets and sidewalks and parks into shelters or government encampments. So if you pick somebody up off the street out of their tent or whatever else, you have to take them to another city or county run shelter or a government encampment. Government encampment. That sounds a little sketchy. What's that about? Okay. Uh, He said, we've seen the homeless population through the country grow between 2019 and 2020 by 3%. Over that period of time, Florida's population of homeless declined by 11%. And DeSantis said, Florida will not allow homeless encampments to intrude on its citizens or undermine their quality of life like we see in states like New York and California, he said. The legislation I signed today upholds our commitment to law and order while ensuring homeless individuals have the resources they need to get back on their feet. But critics are saying this law of just making sure people don't sleep on the street doesn't address the underlying problem of why these people are homeless in the first place. Uh, Economic struggles, drug addiction, mental health issues. So for a lot of people, they're saying this is just a means to clear people off the sidewalk. That's all this is. There's a Democrat, uh, Chevron Jones in Florida, who says this bill does not and will not address the more pressing and root cause of homelessness. We are literally reshuffling the visibility of unhoused individuals with no exit strategy for people who are, are experiencing homelessness. So, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know if you think that's a good thing or not. I mean, I've often thought when I saw people on the street sleeping on sidewalks or, you know, in tent villages, how as a society do we allow this to happen? How do we feel good about ourselves as we go home to our comfy beds in a house that has exorbitant PG&E heating bills, but still we have heat, right? And lights and comfort and safety mostly and how do we just leave somebody in a doorway are we those people that just don't care that are apathetic to the struggles of someone else where's our kindness as a nation and i and so on one hand i like that people are being taken off of the street and put into a shelter or somewhere that's more comfortable or somewhere that maybe they can get services But I don't think he's doing it for the kindness or to help the people. I think he's doing it because he just wants people off the sidewalk. Or maybe because he doesn't care about their struggles. He's just like, nope, don't care where you do it, but it's not happening here. Can't clutter up my city like that. Can't make it look trashy. Can't put people's safety at risk. And I do agree with that, right? I mean, I don't want people's safety to be at risk either. So... I I don't I don't want to not like it because it's DeSantis. And you can't just take people scooping them off the sidewalk, right? And take them to city limits and say, "Now you're on your own." Or give them a bus pass to some other state. You have to take them to a city-run shelter or uh, and the ominous government encampment. Do you like that law? What do you think about it? I mean, he's doing something. I don't know. 
Mama Day 3 Boys with an excellent point. How about prohibiting corporations from buying single-family homes and inflating the rents and home values? Novel concept. Like it a lot. We see it's a problem, right? Preventing people from home ownership. Jacking up rents around the at least the Bay Area, maybe other places. No. Uh, Chris says, no other countries provide free emergency care. That's why we buy millions of dollars of traveler's insurance. Are you talking about health care in other countries? Hmm. There are enough resources, writes Chris B., to house, feed, clothe, educate, and care for every person in the country. He writes, we just choose not to. Every man for himself, him or herself, right? Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Well, apparently, a lot of people can't because look at how many people are sleeping on the streets. Some people need a little assistance, a little hand up. Uh, Joe Blow writes, government needs to mandate people who own homes with extra rooms to give up a room to a homeless person. Really? I mean, technically, this is an extra room. You want to put a homeless person in here? What about the two kids I have in this house? And how do I know who I'm letting into my house? How do I know that that's a safe place? Now my home doesn't become a safe place for me anymore if I have to let strangers in here. I don't like that. Okay, so you would think on the surface it makes sense. People have extra rooms. People need extra rooms. Let's match them up and make it happen. But that's not fair. It's not fair to people who want relative safety and a peaceful life. And you want me to put somebody in here who has addiction problems and mental illness, a ranting and raving lunatic walking up and down my hallway where my kids are trying to sleep? No. Nope. And I think I'm not alone in saying nope to that. And I don't mean to be insensitive to that person's plight, but I don't want it in my house either. Am I, am I, you know, am I the problem? I don't think so. Lady Beatrice says people lose their jobs. They can't afford the housing. If they don't find a job in time and the jobs are scarce, what needs to happen is something to protect people when those things happen. That's very true. Now, that's different than mental health issues or addiction issues, right? Some of those things are a little more difficult to scoop in and help with. But people losing their jobs. As a matter of fact, I just was reading an article the other day about... um rental assistance and i forget what county they're doing it in but if you can't pay your rent you're struggling financially and you're teetering on the ragged edge the count this particular county will give you 500 bucks to help you pay your rent get you over that hump and i don't know how long they do it for how many months they'll do it but it wouldn't it be cheaper even if it was you know i don't know three or four months six months than having this person end up on the street as a homeless person, taking up resources, you know, I, 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 yeah. I mean, there will be some that say, oh, well, why, why should we give $500 to pay that person's rent and not $500 to pay this person's mortgage or rent, right? Because we don't want people to end up homeless. Because if you can help someone avoid that at all costs, it would help society in the long run. Yeah. Um, Vilma writes, DeSantis might as well be putting homeless on a bus and sending them elsewhere, if not in his backyard. That's how the law feels. Yeah. Um, Eric says, if you don't have money in America, you're worthless. Mama writes, how about prohibiting landlords from raising rents unless wages increase as well? You're full of good ideas this morning, aren't you? Love it. Um, Sandy writes, Chris is wrong. Most countries will provide emergency care at no cost to travelers. Thanks, Sandy. Appreciate that. Uh, Lady Beatrice blames the government. They complain way too much about people who need them to help them. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean... It's doing something to get people off the streets, but I don't necessarily know if it's a move in the right direction. And I mean, it's expected because it's DeSantis, right? 
Calvin says Habitat for Humanity has new homes available but can't sell them because home insurance companies won't sell policies anymore in California. I have a story coming up about that as well. Um, These people might lose their home because they can't insure it. We'll talk about that in a little while. But yeah, very true. Good morning to Ron, who writes homelessness on the streets is exactly a government function. The few can't ruin it for everyone. Get them into forced housing and care. Help those that are just not making ends meet and treat the addicted. When you say it like that, it sounds so simple. But for whatever reason, we can't seem to pull it off. You know? Mars says not solving homelessness is intentional to fund programs that pretend to help but pocket the money. Oh, the homeless industrial complex? Is that what we called it? Yeah. It does seem like we're throwing an awful lot of money at something and not getting an awful lot of return on the other end, right? And he pointed when he signed that legislation yesterday to places like California, where the homeless problem remains out of control. Phineas Uh, with a witness to seeing the CHP off Highway 80, handcuffing and arresting a homeless person living near the freeway. Aren't there criminals they could be arresting, like reckless drivers or retail theft gangs? One would think, unless the person was somehow trying to cross the freeway or putting other people in danger, I don't know. Lisa, with a good point, will have to pay for homeless one way or the other. If people have a safe place to stay, we should find a way to help keep them there. That's why I thought that $500 rental assistance was so good. Because sometimes maybe people almost have the rent, but not quite, right? And then they can't pay and they become behind and behind and behind. So maybe that's a great safety net for people. Jim with an idea. Enlist the homeless, he says, which gives them a roof, a job, food training, and veterans benefits for life. What about the people that aren't fit to serve, though, Jim? And I don't know if you've seen homeless people standing on the street corner ranting and raving. Not that all of them do this, but there's a lot of people with mental illness that I don't know if I'd want in the military with a service weapon. I don't know. I mean, I see your point, but I don't think everyone is um, is fit for duty. And I think oh, there's a lot of homeless vets out there, right? There's something that happens maybe to you after you get out of the service and you've seen war in Afghanistan or Iraq or Vietnam or what have you, and you come back with some mental stuff that the um, government hasn't done a good enough job helping people work through. So a lot of people have served and still they end up on the street. I don't know if that works. Anyway, thank you guys for the comments on this. Um, One more from John Watson. I've been driving down the freeway at times, and some homeless person has been trying to cross. Not safe for them or those trying to swerve and avoid hitting them. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it can be scary. And so perhaps that's the whole point of um, of trying to get people off the street. I don't know. Uh, But It'll be interesting to see how that works with the courts and whether um, that Florida law stands up. I tend to think it's going to, there's going to be a lot of pushback on that. And I think it seems insensitive. I don't think that would pass muster here in California. And so our problem persists. We'll talk a little bit about Prop 1 uh, in a moment. But first, let's do a little bit of news here on the Nikki Maduro Show. I have been remiss. It's been nearly an hour, and I have not done it. So let's get it done. Here it is. Now, from around the world to up your street, the Nikki Maduro Show presents News Czar Kim McAllister. Yes, indeed. The Justice Department is suing Apple for allegedly violating antitrust laws. The lawsuit filed along with 16 state and district attorneys general claims Apple has monopolized the smartphone market by blocking competitors from uh, accessing hardware and software features of the iPhone. The DOJ also alleges Apple deliberately made the quality of cross-platform messaging worse to incentivize users of other smartphones to switch to the iPhone. That, I think, is definitely true. 
A $1.2 trillion government funding package has been introduced by lawmakers as a possible partial government shutdown still hangs over our heads. The House and Senate has until the end of Friday to pass this bill or there will be at least a short-term lapse. Departments in trouble of running out of funding include defense, education, and the legislative branch. The United States has submitted a draft resolution to the United Nations calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza that is tied to the release of hostages by Hamas. That is what Secretary of State Antony Blinken said yesterday. This comes as the civilian death toll in Gaza continues to rise and the humanitarian situation there grows more dire every day. The search continues for that missing University of Missouri student. His name is Riley Strain. The 22-year-old vanished March 8th after he was asked to leave Luke Bryan's bar in downtown Nashville. Strain's bank card was found on the embankment near the Cumberland River last weekend. No sign of him. The interpreter for Los Angeles Dodger star Shohei Otani is without a job after the team fired him in the wake of accusations that he stole from that baseball icon. News came out yesterday following an LA Times report that Otani's interpreter took part in a massive theft of funds from the baseball player to place bets with an illegal bookmaker. A spokesperson for Otani originally told ESPN the funds were knowingly transferred to help cover that gambling debt with the Hollywood law firm Burke Brettler saying in a statement Otani was instead the victim of being ripped off. Um, I, that's such a problem. I mean, ha- okay, so there's a, maybe there's a cultural or a language or something, then maybe not understanding that if you're a baseball player, you can't get involved in gambling or bookmaking or anything like that. I understand trying to do something nice for someone. He was being totally taken advantage of. It's not good. The San Diego Padres and the, uh, Padres and the Los Angeles Dodgers are each leaving South Korea with a win under their belts. Padres outlasting the Dodgers 15 to 11 in the second game of that series in Seoul today. San Diego racked 17 hits, with the biggest being uh, Manny Machado's three-run uh, home run in the top of the ninth. Is anyone paying attention to those international games? I mean, it's kind of cool that they take the American baseball to other countries and do that. I don't know. It's interesting. Um, I'm, more inter- I'm really interested on this Shohei Otani case. Oh. Speaking of gambling, the Florida Supreme Court will not hear the challenge to the seminal gaming compact. The court ruling West Flagler Associates, which owns casinos around the state of Florida, does not have the authority to address the constitutionality of a law. The decision from the bench, refile the case in trial court. The whole issue here is mobile sports betting, where participants can place wagers with the Seminole tribe through a cell phone app anywhere in Florida, not just on tribal land. The plaintiffs argue the governor and legislature exceeded their authority in enacting that compact, and so perhaps uh, not the best use of uh, the law in Florida there. Californians, speaking of homelessness, uh, California voters are backing this new effort to tackle the homelessness crisis. Prop 1 finally secured enough votes to pass yesterday, about two weeks after the primary was held. So it was neck and neck there for a while. Uh, Governor Newsom calling it a huge victory, uh, saying the biggest change, uh, it's the biggest change that the state has seen in years. He wrote on social media, this will repair the damage caused by decades of broken promises and neglect to those suffering from severe mental illness. The measure allows for $6 billion to go go toward building housing and drug treatment facilities. I still don't necessarily know that I'm behind this. I didn't vote for it. I thought it took money away from counties that desperately needed it and didn't really have to account for where that money was going. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. I mean, and once again, it's one of these things where we're doing, at least it's doing something different. I don't know, you guys. Well, the jury's still out on this one. 
Um, there's speaking of homes, there's a, another push to get more homes built here in California and to get them built even faster. The attorney general is behind a new bill that would make cities and counties have to pay right away if they violate the housing law. As it stands now, the penalties only kick in weeks or months after a court order is issued. Attorney General Rob Bonta says the bill would ensure the state could quickly hold accountable those who refuse to follow the law and act in good faith. A California energy giant is agreeing to pay more than $13 million for dozens of oil spills. They were all in Kern County, biggest in 2019, nearly 800,000 gallons spilled. That one came from an abandoned well. It polluted a creek near Bakersfield. Chevron was hit with fines from two state agencies. Most of the money will go to the Department of Fish and Wildlife, the rest to the Department of Conservation. So you got it. Pay the fines, give them the money to help for the cleanup, right? Some Californians are facing heavy fines this tax season for not having health insurance. It could be up to 850 bucks for adults, $425 for kids. State officials say the penalties are often far more than the cost of co- uh, coverage through Covered California. The marketplace offers plans as low as $10 a month, although I've heard it's a lot more expensive for most people. During the 2022 tax season, more than 271,000 households ended up paying the state about $312 million because of not having health insurance coverage. There's something new coming to California's Redwood National Park in Oric, California. About a million people visit every year to see the tallest trees in the world. And pretty soon they'll be greeted by a cultural center right at the entrance in Oric, which is this little town that there's really not much to it. But they've got a historic agreement made this week to give the Yurok tribe a piece of its land back in 2026. Work on the center begins next year. The tribe says it will tell the story of its people and also include more hiking trails for people that are stopping by that area. I'm following this story. Just a really, really sad situation. This, you could call it a family tragedy. It's even more devastating this morning. Remember the family that was hit uh, as a car jumped the curb and they were waiting for a bus. They were taking their family to the zoo. They had a, uh, I think a six month old and a newborn. Well, the newborn had been in the hospital in critical condition and sadly didn't, didn't survive this. So the six month old baby, oh, it was a six month old baby who was on life support after Saturday's bus stop crash has died. His one-year-old brother and parents were also killed when an SUV plowed into them outside the West Portal Library. The 78-year-old driver has been arrested in the hospital but is no longer in police custody. Her lawyer didn't reveal why but says sometimes accidents happen without it being a crime. Prosecutors are still analyzing toxicology reports. They're looking at the vehicle itself to see if maybe there was some type of uh, malfunction, brakes didn't work, something. But a whole family, mother, father, one-year-old, and a six-month-old now dead. Life changes in an instant sometimes. There's some new information out on a wrong way crash that happened near the Bay Bridge. A 57-year-old Lafayette man was the driver killed on Interstate 580. This happened Tuesday morning in Oakland. David uh, Weiner was headed to work in San Francisco's financial district when a pickup truck with two suspected thieves inside hit his car head on. El Cerrito police chased the two men after a tobacco store break-in, then called it off moments before the crash. Both suspects and another driver were seriously injured. No word yet on what charges those men will face in that case. A police chief in Sonoma County is pleading with Safeway to take urgent action. Ronald Nelson says the Sebastopol store needs to hire more security during afternoon hours because of a spike in crime. He says high school students are often to blame, and that is raising alarm among shoppers and parents. Nelson sent a letter to the president of Safeway's uh, the grocery chain here in Northern California, offering to help come up with tactics to make the store feel safe. I mean, I guess he doesn't have enough officers to post a couple in the parking lot during this spike, it always makes me 
look askance when the police are urging you to get your own private security. Like, why? You can't make the town safe enough? What's wrong with you? All right. In San Francisco, speaking of crime, they're starting to install new crime-fighting tools. About 400 cameras are going up at 100 intersections around the city of San Francisco to read license plates. This will help police find suspects faster, especially those accused of stealing cars or stealing from stores. Mayor London Breed says the cameras can play an invaluable role in tracking down criminals and holding them accountable. These cameras will be ready within the next three months. So get ready because they're going to know all about you in San Francisco, right? You pass through an intersection, they're like, oh, Calvin Wong's here today in San Francisco. Look at that. The Lady Beatrice, welcome. We know where you are and we know what you're doing. Hmm. Here's an interesting story. A New York woman known as the hot dog hooker has been arrested again. Catherine Scalia first made headlines in 2012 when she used a hot dog truck as a front for selling sex, which is how she got the nickname, the hot dog hooker. Now she's been hit with stalking charges, accused of repeatedly harassing a man at his office and his home, exposing herself and shouting, uh, anti-Semitic remarks. This got, took an ugly turn. Scalia is now 57, apparently also made news in 2016 for posting a yard sign offering nude lap dances on a swing. Yeah, well, she's arrested again, so we'll see how that works out. Um, I don't know if you guys saw this story yesterday. Wild. This skier at Mammoth Mountain miscalculated how a wild coyote would react to his offer of friendship. This guy... There's a video uh, posted to the Mammoth subreddit showing this man extending his hand as if it's a dog who's going to sniff it and let you pet it. No. He puts his hand out to the coyote, and the coyote kind of walks toward him, and then all of a sudden lunges and bites the man's hand, right? Now that skier will have to get rabies shots for trying to interact with a wild animal. And I know those are painful, And I, you know, don't wish harm on anyone, but that's kind of a boneheaded maneuver. Um, Today, National French Bread Day. Mm -hmm. Just in case you needed to know, French Bread Day is what we have. Uh, I'm... This report is uh, sponsored by you. Of course, the show is crowdfunded, which means we do rely on you to help us fund this Nikki Maduro show. Find us at the com, where you'll see the Patreon and the PayPal links. It's also in the show description as well, uh, with a lot of other links that may be useful to you. So please check that out. Uh, and the, again, the website, the com. So uh, thank you for that. And I'm Kim McAllister on the Nikki Maduro show. Nikki, by the way, We'll be back tomorrow. So she took the day off because her daughter needed to have a procedure. And it's not a big deal, but, you know, her daughter, and she said this publicly, suffers from Crohn's disease. So I've got my fingers crossed that everything goes well and that all the results of the uh, procedure happening today come back wonderfully. So I invite you to think good thoughts with me. All right, let's get back into these stories. I'm not going to have Loretta Lynch. I was really hoping, but that means that um, we'll probably have her tomorrow or maybe on Monday. So something to look forward to. There's a lot to talk to her about, including raising the rates, PG&E, raising our power rates again. The AT&T landlines, right, that AT&T wants to take away from us. And how many people came out to give the CPUC a total earful on that? I was talking to Pat Thurston yesterday, telling her that I might have Loretta Lynch on the show today. And she said, oh, good, ask her. She said, my power bill was $1,500 this month. I said, $1,500? How much is it usually? She said, lately, it's been about $800. I don't even know how you afford to pay $800 a month for power. And now $1,500? I said, what? You're keeping the... As Nikki and I talk about the rich people level of heat, yeah, or you know, poor people level of heat, which is what you set the, the thermostat to like 60 and hope for the best. She's like, no, we're wearing sweaters. We're using, uh, she said, I have a pellet stove. We're doing that. So I don't know how 
How it's so expensive. Outrageous. Speaking of money, Sue Ann sent me this story, and I'm so grateful. And we've talked about these things before, and it's just another one of the, like, cog and the, you know, uh, the salary a single person needs to live comfortably in 25 major U.S. cities. So to live comfortably as a single person in 99 of the largest U.S. metro areas, you'll need to maintain an income of $93,933. We're going to bump it up to ninety four grand. That according to a recent analysis done by this group called Smart Asset Analysis. They define comfortable, because what's comfortable to me and what's comfortable to somebody else might be different. They say comfortable is defined as the income needed to cover a 50-30-20 budget. That assumes 50% of your monthly income can pay for necessities like housing and utility costs. I think that number is up for us. Um... 30% can cover discretionary uh, spending, and 20% can be set aside for saving and investment. So that's comfortable to them, a 50-30-20 plan. Smart Asset extrapolated the income needed for a 50-30-20 budget based on the cost of necessities using data from the MIT Living Wage Calculator. So here's the income a single person, not a family of four, just one person living alone, needs to live comfortably with that type of 50-30-20 situation in the 25 U.S. cities with the highest cost of living. This is just to live comfortably. In New York City, you need $138,570. In San Jose, California, you need $136,739 to live comfortably. In Irvine, it's $126,000. Santa Ana, $126,000. Boston, 124. San Diego, 122. Uh, Chula Vista, 122. And San Francisco, you would think it would be higher, $119,558 to live comfortably. Seattle's 119. Oakland is pushing 119. It's 118, uh, 768. So $118,000, 768 to live comfortably in Oakland. Uh, Arlington, Virginia, 117. Newark, New Jersey, 116. I'll just pick out the California cities. Long Beach, 115 or 114 and change. Anaheim, 114. Honolulu is 111. Los Angeles is 110. Aurora, Colorado, 110. Portland, 110. Riverside, 109. Sacramento, $104,000 a year for a single person by themselves, to live comfortably. I mean, come on. Raleigh, North Carolina, 102. Gilbert, Arizona, 102. Glendale, Arizona, 102. Wow. I mean, some of these cities have higher costs of living. But still, I don't know if your average citizen is pulling $100,000 a year or more. And we're not talking about someone who's supporting a family because then you need to make even more. No wonder people are ending up homeless, right? Because what we're making is not on par with what we're paying to live here. Oh. Uh, Those who live alone pay a significant singles tax in large cities when it comes to the cost of food, shelter, and transportation as well. So... Thank you to Sue Ann for sending in that happy, 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 joy, joy story. Appreciate it. <clears throat> I'm telling you. Um, did you see the story about Katie Porter having one regret? And I agree with her. She says she regrets saying that special interests spent to rig the California Senate race. That word rig. She regrets saying it. Uh, she lost the primary, of course. And so when she was talking about it afterward and she was looking at where the special interest money went, she said the special interest money um, rigged California's Senate race. She says, now, obviously, I wish I had chosen a different word, right? Uh, Because that word 
is reminiscent of what Trump said. So I don't think you ever want to say an election was rigged anymore because now it has this whole different connotation. And so when she said this, she got a lot of pushback for it. Um, she said in this interview with this podcast, I think the podcast called Pod Save America. What a great name for a podcast. Um, she said uh, that the backlash undermined the important truth that California's elections have actually been handled very well. She said our California election officials do a terrific job and that the state of California, she said, should be a model for a lot of the country as far as the way that we hold elections here. But then she went down, went back and reiterated what she was trying to say this time without that buzzword rigged. She said money is warping politics. Uh, the cryptocurrency industry uh, and Representative Adam Schiff's allies, she said, spent millions of dollars trying to suppress her vote, share and prop up Republican and former baseball star Steve Garvey, who is overwhelmingly likely to lose to Schiff in November, even though he's ahead in the polls. Big money does influence our elections, according to Porter. Outcomes are manipulated and distorted when you have people coming in, spending millions and millions of dollars at the last minute. Did she lose because of the money and the spending? Or did she lose because people just like the other candidate better? Does it really all come down to the money there? I don't know. I voted for Porter. I'll tell you that. My husband and I both did. So I thought, but honestly, I would be happy with Schiff or Porter. So it's okay for me. Either one is fine. I thought, though, when she lost that Immediately, my, th my thought went to, she should run for governor. Can you imagine Governor Porter in California? I think she would be great. And now uh, there's a piece in the LA Times talking about how California has never had a female governor. And that we're this progressive state, right? Usually we're ahead of the curve when it comes to these things and still... Women haven't been able to break that governorship glass ceiling. But that could be over in 2026. For 130, 173 years, California has had 40 governors, none of them female. Even though I would say we're not adverse, so we don't look down on female politicians, right? For years, our two senators were both women. But um, this time around, so far, and Katie Porter's not running as of yet, but we've got Democrats Eleni Kunalakis, who is California's first female lieutenant governor, Tony Atkins, the first woman to lead both the Assembly and the State Senate, and former State Controller Betty Yee is also running. They have all declared their candidacies to succeed uh, Governor Gavin Newsom, who's uh, out because of term limits. And all of them are credible candidates. So it's possible that we could see a first uh, female governor in the state of California. I don't know. We'll see who rises to the top in this race. Uh, other people apparently running, Democratic Attorney General Rob Bonta, possible gubernatorial candidate. That's not official. If he wins, he'd be the state's first Filipino-American governor. State Schools Chief Ch uh, Tony Thurmond, who is running, he would be uh, California's first Black and Latino governor. Atkins would be the state's first openly LGBTQ plus governor, as well as its first female governor. So, I don't know. In California, I don't know if you knew this, women outnumber men among registered voters. So, you can blame us for never having elected a woman to the governorship. Uh, there have been 49 women, 30 Democrats, and 19 Republicans who have served in gov as governor in 32 states. That according for the Center for American Women and Politics at Rutgers. I'm... I like the idea of a female governor here in California and maybe I'm not wise, but I tend to vote not on gender 
but for the person I think will do the best job. And that could be a woman. It could be the Filipino person. It could be the black person. It could be the Latino person. It could be the white person. It could be the, the dude, whatever. If I think that you're going to do the best job running the state, then I don't care what your statistics are, what, you know, your what gender you are. If you're, I don't, it doesn't bother me if you're nine, non-binary or trans. If you're the person for the job, then you're the person for the job. But maybe in a state where we haven't seen that yet, maybe it's time to. But I have a hard time just voting for a woman just because she's a woman, right? I don't know. She has to be the right person at the right time. They're doing better, though, as far as women in the governorship in Arizona. They've had five female governors. Kansas, New Hampshire, and Oregon have each elected three female governors. Some states have had two. Why not in California? According to this article, no particular reason. They say it can't really be written off as misogyny because according to, in addition to having three female U.S. senators, uh, we've elected numerous women to statewide office. 50 out of 120 legislative seats in Sacramento are held by women. And about a third of the California congressional delegation is female as well. All five members of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors, women. Los Angeles has a female mayor, as does San Francisco and many other cities around the state. So maybe there's not a lot of people, a lot of women that have tried to be the governor. I don't know. Um, Diane Feinstein, Kathleen Brown, Meg Whitman, those have been the serious contenders as far as the female governorship. Feinstein came the closest to winning. That was back in 1990. She became the first woman in state history to get a major party's nomination for governor. But that's when she lost it to Senator Pete Wilson. Remember that? Pardon me. Um, so we'll see what happens. I mean, I love the thought of Katie Porter running. I think right now of the field of people running, that would be my choice. But I don't know. I have to look into it, dig into it, and do the research. Do you? What do you guys think? Let's go to the chat and see what you have to think, uh, have to say about women in politics. John Slade writes, Arnold was a horrible governor after he did some good stuff with regards to voting rights in the pandemic. Hmm. Um, propagandists and disinformation parasites. Okay, that's not about, I, I hear you, I'm off topic, but yes. Um, Blue Spark, an estrogen American as governor would be just fine with me. That's funny. Uh, I would love to have a dude as governor, like a server dude, <laughs> like Spicoli as governor. No. Um, John says, I wasn't so offended by Porter's rigged statement. She was hurt and a bit sore after losing and having people from her own party funding Garvey for an easy win. That's true. I have to cough. Pardon me. Um, I do think she was hurt. I do think that you're right about that. But when I first read that she said that, kind of the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. Anytime someone says an election is rigged now, I think, oh, it, it it's like a Trump beacon. And I don't think she meant that. So I, I don't know. Huge, huge thank you to Marilyn for the $5 super sticker. <laughs> thank you for being here, Marilyn. And thank you for contributing. I really appreciate that. Jenny T., thumping in this morning with a $10 super sticker. I don't know why I said thumping, but thank you, Jenny T. I appreciate that very much. And Spencer, again, with the $5 uh, super sticker. Thanks, you guys, for contributing to the show. The Nikki Medoro Show.com is the website. And of course, as you see, the super chats and super stickers are open here on the Nikki Medoro Show. So I don't know, do you vote for a person just because of their gender? I don't do that. I don't. Mm-mm. John says Sean Penn would make an excellent governor. I don't know about him. Sometimes he gets a little... So, all right. Let's talk about what's happening in San Francisco. A lot of businesses leaving. You know, Macy's leaving in uh, Union Square. The mall 
Uh, Nordstrom's gone, right? A lot of big businesses checking out. There's also some good things happening. So I thought we could talk about that for a minute. Ikea in downtown San Francisco is opening its new dining hall. They're going to have new food, new drink options. Here's some of the things that are coming in San Francisco for shoppers at the Ikea Center. They have Momo Noodle coming, Curry Up Now, Kaima, and Curb. Those are some of the uh, the eateries coming to their food hall at Ikea. Uh, it, it's interesting. The Swedish Deli is currently open there. This is at 945 Market Street. It's 52,000 square feet, three floors. And so, you know, this is a business that's new, that's opening, hopefully thriving. Hopefully they can keep the retail theft down there. Also coming to San Francisco, despite all the empty storefronts in the Union Square area, one of the world's top luxury watch brands is opening a new boutique. But I'm hoping they have good security. German watchmaker L.A. Lang and Son, not your typical retail store. They call it a salon. They're now taking over the third floor space on Geary Street rather than a ground floor. Maybe that makes it a little uh, more difficult for people to come in and rip you off. You have to book an appointment before you go to their salon. I'm going to sneeze. I'm sorry, you guys. It's coming. Uh, is it? Nope, it's not coming. Whew. That sounded like something else, but it wasn't. Um, so you have to book an appointment uh, rather than just wandering in off the street. They have just a few watches on display. They don't have like, you can't scoop a bunch up, grab it and leave, right? A lot of the space is dedicated to hospitality elements. So they've got couches, they've got a bar, they've got a coat closet. Well, those comfortable couches could be a calling, you know, a beacon for people off the street. But I don't think they just let the riffraff in. This German watchmaker, their watches are handcrafted with gold components, precise timekeeping, and they retail for around $100,000 each. The most affordable thing in the store is $20,000. They make only 5,000 watches a year, this company. And they say they think it's paramount paramount for them to have good representation in the Bay Area. And so they're coming in. Uh, used to be you had to travel to Orange County, New York, or Miami. But now here in the Bay Area, we have a destination as well. So if you want, want to spend twenty dollars to $100,000 on a watch, you know right where to go. And hey, you know what? Let's hope they do well, because San Francisco needs the tax revenue and needs businesses to come in. So hopefully they're they're okay and, and they're, you know, not one of these companies that close because their employees can't get to and from the business without suffering some kind of crime. This is a story I mentioned a little earlier that I wanted to talk to you about, and this is homeowners insurance in California. This is rough. We've got all these insurance companies leaving our state. The threat of wildfire, the threat of earthquake, the threat of flooding in some areas as well. Most of the time, if you have a mortgage, you're required to have homeowners insurance. Well, this house in Santa Rosa, they were almost victims of the glass fire in 2020. The flames came 75 yards from the front door, according to the homeowner. She said when the flames got close, they experienced uh, th th those flames got close. They've experienced three fires while living in this Santa Rosa house for the last 22 years. They say they've always insured their home with farmer's insurance until two weeks ago when they got a letter from the company saying their policy had been canceled. She said, I felt abandoned and scared, and this is not a good feeling. There's no talk of mitigation, looking at um, fencing or foliage, just a flat cancel. No chance of renewal. This couple has never, never filed a claim against their homeowner's insurance. The only reason they're canceled? 
Their address was close to the wildfire zone. They hired insurance brokers to see which company would insure them. They had no luck. They say they brokers went out looking for insurance for us. We were denied from 157 home insurance companies. No one will take them. These are people, presumably, who pay their bills, who pay their insurance on time, who've never filed a claim. But because they're in the high fire danger zone, right, because the flames came 75 feet away from their house, that's it. The man, his name is Rick, he said, today I got seven denials. If this couple doesn't get homeowner's insurance, they say they could lose their house. Without fire insurance on the loan and the mortgage, they could demand payment immediately. What's supposed to be the American dream, he said, is not there. Now, the state of California does offer this last resort option. It's called the California Fair Plan. Um, This couple has applied for it. But they say that is absolutely not an affordable option. The cost is 60% higher and it's less coverage as well. Um, The husband is retired. They're on a fixed income. They don't have a lot of other options. She says they can't even sell their home because it's not insurable. So it really puts them between a rock and a hard place. She said, no one's going to buy my home now if they can't get insurance. There goes the property taxes. There goes the property value. There are people moving out of Sonoma County. And sadly, according to this article, thousands of Californians are feeling the pain of the homeowner's insurance crisis. Many companies have announced limited or stopping new policies altogether because of inflation, because of the risk of wildfires. In the last 10 years, according to Janet Ruiz with the Insurance Information Institute, for every dollar of premium insurance companies took in, they paid out $1.08. So it's not sustainable. They say, we want to be here. We're working with the California Department of Insurance. We're hoping we can get solutions, which would mean more insurance for Californians. But they're paying more than they're making. Senator Mike McGuire, state senator, says we need a pathway that homeowners can get renewed yet again and get back into the traditional insurance policy. The couple in Santa Rosa says what they would like is a moratorium to force these private insurance companies to stay in California for affordable rates so we can keep a shelter and a home for ourselves. Right now, there's a few pieces of legislation winding through the state capitol being discussed Um, but some people are saying, listen, if you don't act soon, then we could lose everything. We could lose our house. We could be forced to move. Um, and their neighbors are going through it too. So it's scary. You know, you you work your whole life and then because of the risk of wildfires and climate change, here we are horrible. And I, I'm afraid of that too. I don't live in as high a fire danger zone, but here I am in Sonoma County, right? We've never filed a homeowner's insurance claim, but that could happen to us. So we need to do something, something affordable for people. I know, charge me another $2 to cover your eight cents. I don't know. Do something. The state of California, I think, is going to have to get involved in a more meaningful and a larger way than just the California Fair Insurance Plan. They're going to have to expand it. They're going to have to make it cheaper. I don't see any other way. Have Has anyone in the chat been affected by this? Uh, Lady Beatrice says insurance companies are given too much leeway. Cameo says the trouble with insurance is living in the wildlands interface. Yeah. No, Nancy. Nancy received a termination letter last week. Oh, I hope you find another insurance carrier. I hope you don't go what they're going through, those people. Oh, no. I'm sorry, Nancy. Fingers crossed for you. Dave writes, I heard they're trying to pass a law that says if you don't sell homeowners insurance in California, you can't sell any insurance in California. Not a bad idea. 
but it also has to be viable for them, right? I mean, it has to be a business where they're turning some kind of profit. I don't know. Randy, I agree. California needs to figure something out here and take care of its people. Absolutely. Not cool. Ren says, yeah, with, without insurance, they can't even sell the house. It's true. Yeah, Nancy, this is a scary situation. Man, you must live in a high fire danger area. Mm. Well, I hope you can find something. Let us know what happens with this. And if you do contact the California Fair Insurance Program, you know, let me know how much more is that going to cost you a month to make that happen? OCB writes, wait till they start denying coverage because you're in a high crime area. I mean, it could happen. Hasn't yet. Could happen. Lori says some states will have to start selling uh, self-funding homeowners insurance if homeowners want to stay. And that's what I think California is going to have to do. These people were denied by 157 companies. No. And that's horrible. Because how do you, you know, protect your investment? How does the mortgage company protect their investment? Ugh. Deidre writes, we have State Farm, which is no longer writing new policies in California. I was afraid they wouldn't renew my policy this year, but they did. Thank goodness. And the question is, without legislation, how long are they going to keep renewing it? Yeah. Um, Randy says, California voters are partially to blame for this mess. Prop 103, limited, constrained what home insurance companies could do. Jim writes, my insurance went up $100 a month for the almost the same coverage, and my copay went up as well. Yeah. LAX paint, you're going to have to insure your insurance. Man, I don't know if Windsor is a fire zone. I would think yes, depending on what part of Windsor you live in. But we've seen flames come pretty close through the town of Windsor. So I would think it, it is, but I, I don't know. I don't have the chart right in front of me to look at that. Uh, fair, fair quoted me $3,000 a year covering fire only. That's the California fair insurance man. Dave says, I never feel bad for any insurance company. They're only in it for themselves. Mm. Randy says, um, oh yeah, for every dollar of insurance companies taking in, they're paying out $1.08. Yes, I did say that. Absolutely, I did. And so I understand that it's not a successful business proposition for them. What are we going to do about it? Nancy says, I own my own home, so I will stay here uninsured. I told my kids if my home burns, I'll still own the land. That can't be good. I guess, you know, really double check that the oven's off. Clear away all the brush from every, you know, section. Get a fire uh, protected roof. Something. That's so scary. Well, check in with the same program, the California Fair and see if there's something that can be done. I hate to think of you sitting out there with no insurance. Deidre, California state fund workman's comp insurance that is backed by the state. They can do it for homeowners if they can do it for workman's comp. Good point. On the other hand, says Eric, look at states like Florida, which cover homes built in flood zones. People just keep rebuilding houses over and over again since they're built on the ocean and they wash away a lot. And I guess that's the question then. Should we be rebuilding homes in fire zones? You know, if we know it's a risk. It's not easy to give up your land where you live. But every time I look at, not that I'm going to move, I can't afford to move. I couldn't afford my house right now if I tried to buy it. But sometimes, you know, you see things for sale. And now when I do, especially because I I have I'm on uh, Facebook with the you know for the love of old homes or whatever the page comes through with the interesting looking houses, and I like to look. I'm a looky loo on the internet, but some of these houses, the first thing I look is oh, they're on the top of a mountain with open space, trees all around. Nope, 
Oh, they're on the an ocean bluff overlooking the sea. That house is going down, right? That's the first thing I think of now is uh, maybe in another life. <laughs> Years and years ago, I would have went, oh, look at that house in the middle of the forest. Or, oh, look at that house right on that ocean bluff with beautiful views of the ocean from every window. What a dream. Now I'm like, nope. Nope. That's a red tag coming to you. No, thank you. John says, every inch of California is a fire zone. I see your point, but it's not technically true. Uh, LAX paint. It's just what the insurance companies are claiming. Oh, the one dollar eight cents for every dollar. I mean, it seems to be an average, and that was um, information from this group. Who is? I'll go back to it. Um, it's an insurance group, so it's like an an aggregate of um of. It's not just one company. It's all the companies, right? So trying to find the name of the company or the name of the uh, it's the insurance information institute that says this um and they i may be part of the insurance industry but uh they're the ones saying that for every in the last 10 years for every dollar of premium they took in insurance companies insurance companies paid out one dollar and eight cents so it's not sustainable insurance Information Institute is where that comes from. So I don't know what they use to calculate that number or if anyone's double checked it. Uh, but yeah, Blue Spark says it ticks me off when these huge fancy houses are allowed to be built right on the ocean cliff or whatever, because it's so beautiful. But when they slide off, they holler for FEMA and insurance money. It's true. And I can see, I mean, he probably paid millions of dollars for that house. I didn't think about the consequences. I said that like a Michigander. Consequences. Dave says, I don't believe their $1 versus 108 stat. Insurance companies lie for a living. I know a former attorney that made a living suing them. He says they are ruthless. Ooh. Um, Ricky O'Bear says, after Paradise, I sold properties which were near... Uh, I sold any properties which were near any wooded area. I'll rent in Albany. Were you living out near Paradise? Gosh, that'd be scary to be part of that fire. It makes me wonder if PG&E colludes with state insurance companies to start a fire for profit on both sides. Oh, I mean, diabolical. The thought of that. Brian says it's simple. If they raise their rates by 10%, they turn an 8% loss into a 2% gain. If they won't live with that, the company should not be allowed in California. I'm speaking as a corporate loss leader. They need you in Sacramento, Brian. Check in with the California uh, insurance department because they need they need you over there. I mean, 10%, that's a lot that, that our rates would go up, right? At a time when we're already paying exorbitant PG&E rates and everything else, but... 10% increase is a lot better than the alternative, which was, what, 3000 did I read $3,000 a month for fire only for the from the California Fair, someone said? Wow. Um, John says, uh, a lot of what burned in Santa Rosa wasn't in the woods either. Once things started burning, whole neighborhoods went up in smoke. Coffee Park? Absolutely right. Oh, Sharon... My heart hurts. Farmers just canceled my homeowner's insurance after 30 years of coverage. Oh, no. Jeez, Louise. I hope you get an, another insurance company to come in and pick up where they left off. But that's horrible. You know, being a good customer for 30 years and there's nothing, there's no, you know, they don't extend you any courtesy. I'm so sorry, Sharon. That sucks. Len Tillum, according to Cameo, used to say, I'm a lawyer. It's unna an unnatural act for insurance to pay out. They only absorb money from clients. What it feels like sometimes. 
Natalie says my grandma lost her home twice to flooding in Louisiana, 1912 and 27. She first met my grandpa when he was sent by the Red Cross to rebuild it. She was 15. He was 25. Wow. Natural disasters bringing people together. Dave says if they're part of the insurance industry, they're crooked. I guarantee it. Eric says earthquake insurance is also an issue. I expect if there's ever an earthquake that's bad enough to need to make a claim, no one's going to get reimbursed because everyone will be making a claim. I mean, you would think they would be prepared for that eventuality, right? Earthquake insurance is so expensive and has been for so long. And, you know, we have earthquakes, but often not a lot to do that much damage that I, I would think maybe earthquakes are in a different category, but you're probably right. Joanne writes, I'm not defending the insurance companies, but you want the company to be able to pay when you have a loss. If they never make a profit, they may not be able to pay all claims in a catastrophic fire. It makes sense to me, Joanne, but I think the question mark is, how did they get that number and is it true, right? Uh, John says, what happens when no one in the U.S. can get homeowners insurance anymore? Then I guess mortgage companies are just taking a chance on us. You know, well, here's your mortgage. Fingers crossed that your home doesn't get torched and that you can pay it. Hmm. Heidi writes, I live in Florida, and it's very difficult to get insurance on properties close to the water. We've had several large organizations, such as Allstate Insurance, pull out of the state of Florida. Yeah, well, welcome to the, the California party then. I guess that's one way our states are similar, Heidi. Thanks for being here this morning. It sucks. You know, and in order to keep the home, pay the mortgage, the mortgage company requires that you have insurance. So then it leaves you in a horrible position. OCB, anyone get the feeling fleecing Californians by private and public entities is becoming somehow normal? Yeah. Um, really good conversation. I'm so sorry to hear for Nancy and I think Sharon that you guys are losing your insurance coverage. I really, really hope that changes and turns around. Nancy says, I've lived here for over 36 years. I've been with farmers the majority of the time. Thanks a lot, farmers. We are farmers. We screwed Nancy over today. Deidre says, I pay $3,000 a year for earthquake insurance. It's not cheap. So hopefully somebody is saving some of that money in a, an account to cover everything. Last word on this from John. Maybe if no one can get insurance anymore, they won't be able to get mortgages either. Right. And then what do we do? And then here, t Tent Village, here we come. Right? Please. Horrible. Jenny's never paid for earthquake insurance. A lot of people don't. What is it with fire? Like if, you're, if your home burns in a, a regular fire, the insurance company will cover it. But if your home burns in a fire touched off by an earthquake, that doesn't count. Unless you have earthquake insurance, right? Unless you jump through this hope, hoop over here. <sighs> I'm telling you. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's a little scary, all of this. It's very scary. And I'm going to be thinking about you guys now without insurance and really hoping that uh, that something changes and that you guys are able to get covered because that's scary. Speaking of fires, in this weather we're having and in this season we're moving into, a lot of fires are caused by lightning strikes. And this weekend, we've got thunderstorms possible across the Bay Area this weekend. We've got some rain, <coughs> pardon me, and some wind this weekend, and a slight but increasing chance of thunderstorms. Friday and Saturday, we could see some thunderstorms, a 10% or greater chance for thunderstorms, lightning, gusty winds, localized flooding, and small hail. As far south as Modesto, as far north as Wairica, Bay Area cities include San Francisco, San Jose, Santa Rosa. So around the Bay Area, a cold front is coming in Friday, bringing light to moderate rain. Now we've got a chance of lightning strikes. So... Let's hope we don't get lightning strikes and more fires. It's not, I mean, is there a fire season yet? I mean, is there a fire season now or is it just rear round, right? Used to be what? 
October um, would be kind of the end of it, right? And it would start, what does it start around about May or June? I don't know. Maybe it's year round now. And that's just what we have to look forward to. But here we are. I'd still rather live in California than anywhere else. So um, they have released this video of a freeway shooting in the East Bay. A CHP putting out this video happened in Hayward on 880 on Tuesday at about four in the afternoon. So right during the afternoon rush hour, the suspected gunman was located, was arrested. Video shows the suspect as a driver rolling down the window of their car, aiming a handgun in the direction of a vehicle that was recording the footage. The victim wasn't hurt in the shooting. The vehicle suffered damage. It was hit by two bullets on the freeway. They uh, put out warrants for the suspect and the vehicle involved, found the vehicle yesterday with the help of the Hayward Police Department, and uh, took the person into custody. They did. Um, the, wep- re- the weapon used in the shooting was recovered. It was a Glock 17 air gun that used um, caliber metal BBs. The suspect was booked into jail on felony charges, but they're looking for anyone who may have seen this happen. So scary. I'm telling you. These freeway shootings. I was thinking of it when I drove to Livermore the other day. I drove down the East Shore Freeway. I drove down 580 all the way through Oakland. Yeah. I mean, take your life in your hands. Now, statistically, how common is it? You know, what are the chances of getting shot on the freeway? Probably pretty low. But for me... I've done enough stories to see random people get hurt because of this. So, yeah, very scary to see somebody just whip out a an weapon and open fire on the freeway. Mm-mm. Uh, I just saw this story. The most popular dog breeds in the United States. We'll, um, we'll lighten it up a little bit now. And for the second year in a row, it is the French Bulldog that comes in as the most commonly registered purebred dog. So this is a story that comes from the American Kennel Club. So all of these dogs are purebred. The bulldog is, the uh, the French bulldog, is the most popular dog in America. Uh, dachshunds at a nearly two-decade peak as well. So dachshunds are also on the list. And um, let's see, also in the top 10, Yorkshire Terriers and Boxers. I don't know. Uh, Most common breeds registered were, this is the way the list went, Frenchies, Labs, Golden Retrievers, that's what we have, uh, German Shepherds, and Poodles. Then Dachshunds, Bulldogs, Beagles, Rottweilers, and German Short-Haired Pointers. So these are the most common dogs, or the most popular breeds of dogs. I think a lot of people probably have dogs from the shelter that aren't purebred, but Whatever. All right. Hopefully we'll get Loretta Lynch on the Nikki Maduro show soon. Nikki will be back tomorrow. Thank you guys for the conversation that we've had today. Please join me for the Mark Thompson show. That is next here on YouTube. Um, And then the after party live after that. And I have a story on the after party today about this house in the North Bay. Fireproof, allegedly. We'll look into it and see what that, maybe that's the way of the world, right? Building homes in a different way. Thank you to Spencer again for the $5 super sticker, Jenny T for the $10 super sticker, and Marilyn with the $5 super sticker and the nice message. I appreciate all of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the conversation. And I'll see you in just a few moments on the Mark Thompson Show, where Mark's madness continues, and federal former, uh, former federal prosecutor David Katz will be on the show. A lot to talk about, especially when it comes to the Trump legal cases, uh, what's happening with the hush money case you won't want to miss it. So that is coming up next on the Mark Thompson show. So I'll see you there in just a few. But for now, here's Jake. Bye, you guys. Nikki, you're all so awesome. You sprout like a beautiful blossom. You're all so the best. I really can't rest. You're all so awesome. (laughs) 
Wow. Okay. Thank you. You're all so awesome.